Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this live stream event um, hosted by the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, uh, celebrating what we think is a really um, important event, uh, the Weitz Humanitarian Award. Uh, my name is Mike Van Royen. I'm the director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and we're here to celebrate uh, an individual and an organization that has really made, uh, I think, amazing, really important progress in the humanitarian space. Um, uh, just very briefly, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative serves as the humanitarian arm of Harvard University. We seek to professionalize the aid sector by research and education, um, and we've been doing this for over 18 years. Um, we're here to celebrate the Weintz Humanitarian Award. It's in celebration of a, a leader and an organization that have made meaningful contributions to the humanitarian space, particularly issues that uh, we don't necessarily see every day or um, that are really kind of in public, but um, behind the scenes efforts that have really contributed to professionalism and excellence in humanitarianism to really help advance the, the care that we provide for uh, people around the world that suffer from war and disaster. And this is a, a really special day today because we get to celebrate the new humanitarian and its CEO, Heba Ali, who has uh, been leading the organization into a really the new frontiers in reporting on, humanita on humanitarian emergencies, and in particular around humanitarian accountability, really holding the aid sector, this multi-billion dollar industry, accountable for excellence and for the, the uh, appropriate um, uh, services and uh, efforts that it provides to really stabilize uh, c populations around the world that suffer from war and disaster. So really thrilled to have you here. And, and uh, I think the whole um, uh, event today or the, the live stream is really to focus on uh, nuances and some of the questions that we have around the New Humanitarian. And so I'd like to do, first of all, is introduce Heba Ali, the CEO of the New Humanitarian. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for uh, being here with us today and for accepting this award on behalf of you and the organization. Um, and I'd like to just ask you a few questions and um, kind of get your opinion. So we'll start off by maybe you could explain a little bit about the New Humanitarian, um, its uh, growth and mission and uh, some of the major areas um, that you report on. Sure, and thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege and an honor to receive this award. We're very humbled and thank you to the Weintz family um, for setting this up. Uh, the New Humanitarian is uh, a team of journalists that are trying to build understanding of how best to help people affected by crises around the world. Um, we're essentially trying to produce the world's best journalism about the world's toughest crises, and that takes two forms, really. Uh, one is to shine a light on forgotten crises, the Venezuelas and South Sudans and Yemens of the world um, that aren't necessarily getting uh, mainstream attention. And the other, as you alluded to, is to provide some accountability to this, um, and we do call it an industry, this multi-billion dollar humanitarian relief industry, because it is um, easy to assume that people who purport to do good um, will do good, but actually, unfortunately, there is uh, a lot of wrongdoing along the way, and um, we feel it's really important to have an independent voice that can call that out and, and shine a light on, on what's going on um, under the hood, so to speak. Thank you. Um, and you, you know, you've taken this role of uh, reporting on humanitarian concerns, humanitarian issues specifically, which is different than mainstream media or other forms of media that report on it, what we might say is a little more superficially or they don't dig in as much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've found the value of that specific deep dive into the aid sector and what it can, can give us in terms of accountability? Yeah, I used to work as a journalist for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and one day I'd be covering the environment, the next day I'd be covering politics, the day after you'd be covering arts. And I think these issues are too serious and, and the world is too complex today for journalists not to specialize so that they can do their beat justice. So for us, it's really important to have a news organization that is focused specifically on this, uh, this beat of life and death. Um, and if you ask, as we have, we've surveyed our readers and we ask them how they think mainstream media cover humanitarian crises. And they say it's partial, it's sporadic, mm -hmm. it's selective, and it's not in-depth. And so that's the gap that we're trying to fill. The, you know, m commercial media exist to make a profit and the audiences that we're trying to serve are not monetizable. And so there's a real gap in the market there that unless you're specifically setting out to um, address, it's just not gonna be a priority. 
Yeah, and, and that's you know one of the big stories that you've your you and your the organization have broken is in the sexual abuse scandal in the Congo at the the hands of U.S. Uh, in um, WHO workers and UN workers. Um, that is a great example, actually, of digging in deep to a topic that may have been either never reported or completely glossed over in mainstream media. Can you talk a little bit about that lesson that you learned from that and the power of that? Yeah, and it's it's um, it's terrible to talk about it because it, it was really such a gruesome story where we had 50 women come forward to uh, tell us their stories of sexual exploitation and abuse by people that were sent to their country to help them and um, ultimately led them to um, either exchange sex for jobs. In some cases, uh, they experienced rape. Um, one woman fell pregnant and then had a botched abortion that led to her death. It was really um, horrific stories. and. The thing that shocks me every time is is that everyone knew that this was happening. It was the open secret, but nobody was reporting about it. And and part of that was because it took quite a lot of work to get women to trust that their stories would be used in a way that wouldn't ultimately harm them. Um, but when, when we did expose this scandal, uh, not only did it lead to changes at the World Health Organization at a policy level, they launched an independent commission to look into the charges. Ultimately, they found even more cases of abuse than we had identified. Um, and that led to a raft of changes internally about how they prioritize the protection of women in the service delivery. But what I find even more powerful is we also worked with um, Congolese Radio to get that story to circle back to the communities from which we reported. And it led some women of the community to say, this happened all the time, we just thought it was normal. And now we realize that we have recourse. And so to imagine that you can both shift policy and community behavior, um, the kind of long-term impact I hope that can have is what keeps us in this business and also reminds us that it is so crucial to have that accountability voice because otherwise all this stuff just happens without anyone taking notice or as we've often been told, you know, it takes a story getting into the media for mm -hmm. the CEO to pay attention and do something about it. Yeah, and this is so important when it comes to not only the, the accountability in the moment and with that particular issue, uh, but also in the aid sector itself, because you know, we know that this can happen. We know that there are other parts in the world that this is happening. And so the ability to, to shed light, to create policy changes um, at the international um, U UN level is super important. Um, Related to the issue of, of policy change, one of your favorite topics and one that I've listened to many of your podcasts on is uh, the issue of um, decolonizing aid, localization of humanitarian aid, and the idea of aid financing being um, really challenging and maybe not fit for purpose for the current era or the future era of humanitarian assistance. Could you talk a little bit about, I know we're never going to get to all of it because it's a big topic. But is that your way of telling me to exactly. be concise? In my no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, so, but, it is, but it is a massive topic. Um, but I'd like your impression of, you know, you've kind of jumped into this and really brought out some really interesting um, kind of perspectives in it. Can you just talk a little bit about your view of next steps in getting this to be part of the dialogue in the humanitarian sector? I'd say it is already part of the dialogue, but it's, it's not yet part of the action, and that's the gap that uh, needs to be filled. But essentially, you're seeing um, humanitarian needs rising exponentially at a pace that is just impossible to uh, meet, at least in the current model. And you're also seeing financing for humanitarian relief starting to reach a ceiling. And so while uh, if you take one of the biggest aid organizations in the world, the International Committee of the Red Cross, their funding had gone up and up and up for years, now it's starting to plateau. Mm -hmm. And so we may well be reaching the limits of what the traditional financing model can achieve, and we haven't even yet seen um, the impacts of climate change that are about to, I mean, we're starting to see it, of course, but there's much, much more to come. So if we're already struggling to meet needs now, how on earth are we going to sure. be able to uh, when things are exponentially worse? Um, so there's the, the kind of financial um, challenges, and then there's the moral or ethical challenges, which is that this concept of you know the the rich Western noble donors giving to these poor, uh, in some cases depicted as wretched you know Africans in need, um, in a, in a very extreme example, is a model that that no longer makes sense. And so some of the ideas that we have been, sorry, not just no longer makes sense, but was never really yeah. true. 
So some of the ideas that we've been exploring on the podcast are uh, and the notion of global public investment, that all countries would contribute to a pool of money and all countries benefit. It's not donor and recipient, it is a collective public commons. Um, another, which is um, controversial, and I encourage you guys to listen to this one because it was a fiery uh, podcast, is the idea of reparations for colonialism. And, and so actually, the majority of donors are Western nations that were former colonizers, and where did they get their wealth from? And to what extent are they giving back charity, or are they actually returning what they stole from those countries? So notions like this that start to challenge some of the assumptions that underpin the way aid is, is delivered, and ultimately, I think, um, are, are laying the seeds for what would be a much more sustainable model, which is one of locally driven, resilient communities, rather than this continual kind of um, search for financing every year, begging for more money to respond to ever-growing needs. It's just not a sustainable model. Yeah, and it, and it bumps up against the notion of the, the, the real reason for those development dollars being deployed anyway, especially from the biggest donors like the U.S., um, in terms of the, you know, the impact or the effect on our own foreign policy, our own objectives, um, and trying to de-link those objectives um, to the investments that we really want to make. So it's really super important. And, and I think it's important to be honest about that. I, I testified before, the, uh, amazingly, the UK um, Parliament had an inquiry into the philosophy of aid, as they called it. And one Which of- It doesn't seem like that would ever be possible in the US. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there are, uh, I think some other parts of the world are further advanced in this <laughs> discussion. Um, but part of the, the message I brought was let's, Let's stop pretending that aid is not part of a foreign yeah, policy yeah. Um, uh, objective. And in many countries, it's actually uh, explicitly linked, sure. right? In Canada and Australia and other countries, aid is part of a foreign policy ministry or foreign ministry um, and inextricably linked with the objectives of, of those countries. And so being a bit more honest about that starts to open up some space for more honest, at least exchange and dialogue about, about where we are and what we're talking about. Great. and it. Um, it takes a little bit of guts to go after that, right? I mean, it takes a little bit of um, uh, being counterculture and stepping back and really questioning not only the, the events that are happening on the ground and how they play out in terms of accountability, but also what are we doing in the first place, which takes, um, you know, I, I think a lot of effort and a lot of vision. So I just really appreciate that. And with that, I'd like to cut to a video to tell more about the new humanitarian. So I'll turn it over to the video team. It's hard getting accurate numbers in these stories, largely because these cases are underreported. People are scared of, of reporting. However, aid organizations are also reluctant, uh, in many cases, to look into themselves and to investigate themselves because reporting abuse can result in scandal. More than 1,900 families live in this displaced camp. A whole generation in the Gaza Strip has nearly never left the coastal enclave, never left a single day without power cuts, and has witnessed four devastating military attacks. At the end of 2022, the Taliban released an order saying that no Afghan woman can work for a local or a foreign NGO. <laughs> So really uh, uh, compelling clip, and um, it gets us to the issue of uh, the, the, how do you make this mission happen? Because on your shoulders is not only the, the sort of fundamental questions about the humanitarian space and what to do, but also how to sustain this organization. How do you fund it? How do you make sure that it remains independent? Um, and how do you do so in, a, in an era where media is increasingly sort of 
confined and underfunded because it's too expensive and that you know there's media outlets everywhere. How do you think of building the organization, funding it, sustaining it, <coughs> keeping it, going to the next generation? And in an era when media is under attack and the freedom of the press is under Truly. attack, including in, in Western democracies. Um, it, is a, it is a massive challenge and uh, as, as many of you I'm sure will know, the business model of uh, news has come under huge crisis in recent years, um, first in the move towards digital and then with tech, tech platforms essentially eating up all the advertising revenue. Um, and so uh, it's been it's been a rough ride, uh, in particular for those media that are trying to do public service journalism at the international stage. We've seen many of them close their doors because it just wasn't financially sustainable. The good news is that we have seen a rise in nonprofit journalism. Of course, we are a nonprofit, um, and I think there's an increasing recognition of the importance of, in, in the wake of COVID, in particular, reliable information about crises, and so. We are, uh, our, our main model is grant funding. That is, of course, uh, a huge effort to sustain, but um, more and more, I think, donors are coming to us because they, they see that there's value in this work. We're trying to diversify um, away from dependence just on, on grant funding towards individual donors. Um, we have a membership program where readers can support the journalism, and we're starting now to look at earned revenue. So how can we monetize parts of um, our knowledge while, while keeping access to the main product um, free and accessible to all? It's, it's a, a daily struggle, but um, I think we are seeing a, a window of hope where there's more and more, uh, as I say, recognition of the importance of this kind of work and, and of the, um, the, the need for all of us to take ownership in, in ensuring that the journalism that we want to see in the world can survive and thrive and contributing to that to that in our own ways. Um, so that's on, on the financial side. There are a whole raft of other challenges yeah. in terms of distribution and, and readership, which I'm also happy to get into. It, it, and also the fact that, I, I mean, I think that throughout the aid sector, one of the challenges that we all have or we all see is the sort of lack of neutrality or in, independence, right? Because they're all receiving funds from various donors. How do you how do you do that? How do you make sure, because you have donors, some are institutional, some may be private donors, um, how do you sort of ensure that you remain independent and explicitly so, yeah. um, such that you can serve the purposes that you have but still um, get the funding you need? Yeah, and that's a, um, I think that's always been a challenge for all media, right? Even when media were funded by, primarily through advertising, there was the challenge that the advertiser sure. would try to influence the content. So that's a kind of common challenge that we have learned to build firewalls around. Um, and we communicate really clearly to our donors. The first conversation is, you know, this is independent journalism. Are you, do you understand what that means? And um, uh, we write it into our statutes, we write it into our donor agreements that uh, if you are supporting this, it's because you believe in its independence and, and that any attempt to kind of influence the content would actually not only affect our credibility, but would also affect yours as a donor. And I think most um, most donors understand that, certainly the ones that are interested in funding journalism. Uh, and then we are super transparent with our readers about who funds us, so they can basically decide for themselves if they think there's any influence over the content. And um, because everything we do is public, you know, people can read into it. Um, I hope the work speaks for itself in terms of its independence. Um, but uh, we, 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 we err on the side of transparency, so yeah. that way everyone knows what's going on yeah. behind the hood and uh, and there are no secrets. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, very much you're able to negotiate that dance quite well and, uh, and, and manage that quite well. And I think that, you know, the results speak for themselves. I mean, you know, you, you do some really critical work and being critical of the sector, actually. And, uh, and you know. The same sector that funds us, by the way. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. So I think that's, you know, really important and impressive. Um, you know, we, we, uh, a lot of us teach uh, in a university setting on um, humanitarian issues, and we often think about the future of aid. What's, it, what's next? What are the big issues pushing it? Certainly climate change is one. Um, certainly the, the sort of role of the UN as a, as a governance organization uh, compared to, say, the you know, dysfunction of the Security Council and other issues. W what are you seeing some of the um, issues that you will be reporting on, you and your team will be reporting on in the future, um, that you are maybe not covering as much now? It's interesting. We did a, a series um, recently called The Future of Aid, and we polled a number of leaders within the sector. Actually, one of them was your former uh, awardee, Nadia Murad, the Nobel 
Peace Prize winner, um, and uh, and ask them what do you see as the dominant issue that's going to shape aid in the years to come. And five kind of trends emerged um, from their views. One was mutual and activist aid. So mutual aid being how communities help each other, uh, which I think we saw in a huge way during COVID. But again, as the scale of needs rise, that's going to be the dominant model in my view. And, um, and, and so rather than the aid industry thinking about how can it help, rather thinking about how can it support and nurture and facilitate the mutual aid that's already taking place within communities. Um, the other was decolonizing aid, which we've spoken about a little bit. But since the murder of George Floyd, uh, I think we've seen the racial justice movement that has taken the world by storm has also played out within the aid sector. And there's been a lot of reflection around um, what does a decolonized aid system look like? Does that mean maybe there is no aid at all? Is that what decolonization means? Because actually, if you decolonize the world, these countries wouldn't be in need in the first place. So some of these kind of forward looking debates about um, humanitarianism itself uh, the other big themes that emerged were uh, anticipating crises and resolving conflicts, which to me points to um, a little bit what we were discussing earlier, the recognition that continually turning to the Band-Aid solution, uh, which is humanitarian response at the tail end of the problem, is no longer going to be a model that, that can be sustained. And going upstream to the root cause of the problems is going to need um, more attention and focus. And that, I think, causes a bit of an identity crisis for humanitarians yeah. because they're, by definition, they are firefighters who come in at the end. But when the whole world is on fire, how does that work? And so I think really thinking about if your mission and mandate is to alleviate suffering in the, in the 21st century and you were to start from a blank slate, would the model be begging for money every year to hand out bags of rice and, and tarpaulin, I'm, I'm not sure. And so those are the kinds of issues around um, where humanitarianism is headed that, that we're looking out for. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the big trends barreling towards us are, are climate change. Unfortunately, conflicts are actually uh, rising rather than um, uh, going in the other direction. And then trends like artificial intelligence are having a huge impact on the sector as well, which are likely to change the way aid is delivered and the way we report, as, for that matter. Um, and that will, I, I'm sure, change the output in the years to come. But, but going upstream, as it were, um, and being anticipatory in looking at the pr crisis prevention, for example, means that you'll be in, it'll be in diplomatic circles probably, right? You'll be sort of compelling diplomacy. You'll be compelling political solutions um, to, to avoid conflict, which is a different sort of reporting that you've been doing, right? Yes, for me it's about what, what is the definition of humanitarianism? And we've already seen the boundaries extended, you know, from what was at the beginning um, when, for instance, the International Committee of the Red Cross was created, it was very much focused on helping the victims of war. And already, you know, we're talking about COVID, we're talking about climate change. And I think that's only going to keep growing as these challenges are interconnected and intermixed. You can't kind of draw the line and say we're only sure. in the response mode. So um, we've seen the, the head of the UN uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, so the chief humanitarian official at the UN, is really moving in that direction already. He, he has a background, uh, Martin Griffiths, in mediation, and we're seeing him uh. kind of pull the humanitarian sector towards conflict resolution. I, I think it's only going to go more and more in that direction because there isn't any other choice. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems, I mean, the, the need, there's every indication that the need will continue to far outstrip the resources. And the, especially as you've focused on forgotten crises, they will just be um, notoriously underfunded. And there's no, there's, it seems like there has to be a sea change, actually. Um, I want to get a little bit more to, um, with our remaining time, of the, your sort of concept of the way you message and the way you want to sort of adapt your messaging um, to a new audience, mm. given the competition for readership and all the rest that we've talked about. Um, one of the readers, uh, one of your readers, and also um, who's listening to the live stream event, um, asked, "Have you have do you have plans to expand into doing more video production, for example, and getting to video, even broadcasting at all, um, to to get this news out there?" Yeah, we're certainly seeing audience consumption habits changing, and there is a clear appetite for multimedia. We've seen huge growth in our podcasts and also in our video content, um, and so are looking to um, 
ramp up that offering because it, it serves a different purpose and meets a different audience. And really the, the trend across the media industry is how do you meet audiences where they are rather than forcing them to come to you. Um, and so while of course we have our website, um, that isn't the only channel of communication with our readers anymore. And it's through newsletters, it's through podcasts, it's through LinkedIn, it's through Instagram. And some of the areas where we're seeing the most growth are actually those other platforms. Um, and so we're trying to repackage the articles into formats that can uh, help, in some cases, bring new audiences into the fold because um, someone who isn't necessarily uh, engaged in the humanitarian sector and where we want to raise awareness about humanitarian crises, particularly the forgotten crises, is more likely to watch um, or look at a post on Instagram. Yeah. And yeah. that hopefully is an entry point to then being interested in looking more deeply at the content. So that's a, a work in progress, but yes, we are intending to do more. and, and um, our, one of our goals is to really use video as a way of um, showcasing local journalists telling their own stories, um, so that getting a window kind of into their world yeah. and into their communities. And is that what, what seems to follow is, do you have a sense of strategy or at least um, uh, uh, target audiences that you would like to see expanded? I mean, we know that, you know, we're the, a lot of us are the consumers and a lot of, um, you know, we talked yesterday about where you know the the learners in this space or the leaders in this space are really regular consumers, um, but there's you you probably have other areas and sectors that you want to reach, or at least groups of people that want to reach, politicians, um, local politicians as well. What do you think? Of, how do you think of um, either adapting the content or branding or outreach to sort of expand your reader base? Yeah, we. Audience is such a complex question, and because you're, we are trying to reach multiple different audiences, which each need to be reached through very different channels. So our core audience, as you alluded to, are uh, practitioners and policymakers within humanitarian response, and they're the ones who are, you know, signed up to our newsletters and reading our our um, uh, website. Um, but we're also trying to reach wider audiences because we know that in some of the issues that we're covering, uh, migration and climate change are great examples. Um, Policymaking at a at a national political level is shaped by perceptions of yeah. their constituencies, and so if you can get audiences in uh, the UK or the US um, to to be really engaged on some of these, these issues, they can hopefully then put pressure on their electorate to take the right decisions. Um, that's a much more complicated, um, you know, uh, process because we are a specialized news outlet, and so there we're trying to partner with mainstream media that can bring these stories to wider audiences. So um, that's the likes of The Guardian and Al Jazeera, and um, we've partnered with Reuters, with the, the Associated Press, and that becomes then a megaphone that amplifies these stories um, to audiences that we don't reach directly. And then the third audience that uh, is probably the most complex to reach is the local communities, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but we feel as part of our own agenda to decolonize our journalism in the same way we're, we're talking about decolonizing the aid sector, mm. that it's really important not to just extract these stories from these communities and share them with the international community, but also to share them back with the communities um, that they came from. And to do that, you then have to be looking at translation, at um, radio, because often in, in many uh, countries in the South, that's their main channel uh, for getting information. And so there's a whole other uh, distribution process involved in, in reaching them. And so we're trying to strategically think about those three audiences um, and the way we prioritize them is for each story, who does it need to reach to have its intended impact and how do we get it in front of that particular audience? And that can mean sometimes speaking at events, um, testifying before parliament, all kinds of different tools in our in our toolkit to be able to um, be a bit more bespoke and intentional rather than just pumping stories yeah. out into the ether and hoping for the best. Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, it's, you know, one of the reasons that this um, award for us was so compelling to give um, and recognize you and the organization because, because of that, right? Because of somehow having an agenda that will really try to change the aid sector, um, really ask critical questions, be critical at the same time, um, honoring the fact that this is really, really important work that needs to be done and probably needs to be done in a different way. So, um, you know, I, I thank you for all you've done for the sector itself, for building the new, new humanitarian as a really such a reputable source. Um, and, you know, we have been really um, honored to be able to honor you um, at this event. Um, and so I want to close this down just by saying um, thank you to everybody that attended today. Um, thank you for your um, uh, your contribution. I just want to ask if there's 
Any additional points that you'd like to make? Uh, just that you, you can all become readers if you're not already. Uh, the information is on the website, thenewhumanitarian.org. Uh, we've got a podcast called Rethinking Humanitarianism, which explores the future of aid and some of the ideas we've been talking about today. So uh, subscribe. And um, I talked about the membership program. For those of you who are real fans, you can become a member and be part of making this journalism sustainable in the long term. Wonderful. And um, before we conclude, I want to uh, just get a couple questions from our our group here because we have this uh, engaged studio audience here. And so I'd love to get a couple questions that you might have um, for our for our guest because we have a few more minutes. So let's um, explore further. Um, yes. Um, so I'm just curious in terms of uh, reaching the sort of local policymakers and, and practitioners, um, have you worked at all with like local media in these companies? Um, I mean, I, I could see it working both ways, like these local stories, um, like, so for instance, I worked at a magazine in, in Myanmar, it was local reporters. They would want their stories, sh uh, like, you know, the ha to have the platform of something like New Humanitarian so outsiders can read it. But I could see it working both ways, where like the practitioners working at Myanmar read that magazine a lot. Absolutely, so should I repeat the question? Yeah, it'd be great, yes. thank you. Uh, so the question is, um, in reaching local audiences, that it, it does it go both ways in the sense that you can also be um, curating stories from local journalists and then telling them to an international audience? And to my mind, that's the perfect model, that we are the bridge. Um, we have an audience at international policymaking level, and those, if we can curate the stories that would be of relevance to an international audience and bring them up, and then vice versa, right? That the stories that we're telling that these local communities may not have access to that we then channel them back and so to have uh, that relationship where you have the international media and the local media working together in tandem can have amazing implications on all, all kinds of fronts it's just that you're when you're working at a global scale you're then building those partnerships in each region in each country and so it's, it's a huge effort um, but it's absolutely I, I hope the future of journalism because then you've got a much more um, uh, Fair and, um, in a way, authentic relationship between the international and the local, if that if that makes sense. Um, and it's something we've we've piloted in a few places and are hoping to scale up. Thank you. Um, yes, if you speak loudly and then I'll repeat it for you. Okay, I'll keep my mask on. Thank you. Um, so there was some research done by a group called the Frameworks Institute on behalf of the Alliance for Peace Building, which is an umbrella organization of peace building organizations. Um, on framing and language that would reach Americans. And one of the things that um, comes to mind is, the, is that narratives, that Americans sort of turn away from narratives of victimhood. Mm. In the humanitarian sector, it's almost like, you know, there was a flood, this person's house is washed away, what else do you call them but a victim? And I, I was wondering what you think about that terminology and is that something that you're thinking about reframing at the New Humanitarian? Great. Um, so I, I think if maybe you can reframe or at least uh, comment on the, state the question a little bit and then. Um, sure. Answer. So the Thank questions you. around uh, the framing of people affected by crises and disasters as victims and how that can turn off audiences, particularly American audiences and what we can do about that. Um, and I would argue it's not just American audiences, it's everyone. You know, people are tired of bad news and that's, <laughs> it's, uh, all we do is work <laughs> in the space of bad news. So that can be a real challenge. Um, what we know to be true from even um, scientific research about the way the brain works is that people want to know what they can do and they want to, to have a sense of hope. And, uh, and so w there needs to be an empowering angle to not only um, what we report in, from an audience perspective, but also I think what you're getting at is, is for the dignity of the person affected and how they are represented. And we're trying to work on both of those fronts. So, uh, I think the the first part, uh, which is the main gist of your question, um, how do we tell more positive stories? And I think journalists can often be a bit uncomfortable with that because uh, we're trained to be skeptical and to be challenging. And and there's this feeling that if you tell a positive story, you're letting people off the hook. But actually, sometimes it can be even more powerful to say, look at this solution that so-and-so has found and that's working. Why aren't the rest of you guys doing that? Um, or to say, here's a way forward that has some potential. So we're trying more and more to imbue our journalism with what we call uh, a solutions or forward-looking orientation. And that, I think, helps keep readers engaged because then it's not a hopeless cause. 
But the other part of the picture is the framing of the people. And that, for us, is, a, is not so much about the audience, but about what I was referring to earlier about decolonized journalism. So how do we, as storytellers, want to be treating the subjects of our stories? And, uh, and the framing then becomes very relevant, because um, we should not be, or we believe anyway, at the New Humanitarian, we should not be robbing them of their dignity in the way that we tell the story. And so it can be really small things. And we've started doing this in our headlines. Instead of saying, you know, um, refugees were able to flee from X place, we say, oh, sorry, rather than saying they fled, we said they were able to flee. And that actually, they had the agency and the power and the initiative to get up on their two feet and do something about their lives. Um, and it's small shifts like that. Uh, victim and survivor has been long debated. Um, how do, are you framing? The, the people as passive um, recipients of aid or as agents of change in their own lives, in their own communities. All of these things not only, um, I hope, paint a more accurate picture of, of people's experience, but also shift um, narratives at a, at a longer term, kind of more global scale, about how we view the other and how we view those who are affected by crises. Um, and I hope that helps address some of these wider questions, um, uh, including racism, frankly, and the views that we have of uh, in many cases, and again, these are some of the more extreme examples, but Africans being, you know, corrupt and lazy and, and violent people, those narratives are um, informed by and, and um, reaffirmed by some of the way the media r covers these crises and represents them. So that's some of what we're trying to fight back against. Sorry, long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, but it's really important. And, you know, we talked yesterday, and uh, you maybe may, uh, may comment further, um, you know, the Ukraine crisis is, of course, really important. It's a, it's a major issue in our time, the major refugee and IDP migration, um, no doubting that it is a major humanitarian issue. However, the reporting in that has been completely different in many ways. And so all the, the work that you are doing to, to balance the way that we um, represent other communities, particularly African communities that are affected by war and conflict, um, the mainstream media really upends again by the way that they report the Ukrainian crisis, such that, you know, it's they they report them as us as opposed to major African conflicts with tremendous need. They report them as them. Um, can you just comment a little bit about it? Because we talked about it yesterday, it was really compelling and really eye-opening to realize that um, lens that we're seeing in everyday reporting, just kind of peppering us all the time as seeing. The Ukraine crisis is just different. And and that you don't even notice is happening. It's insidious. There was a particular clip of um, uh, a Western, I think, an American journalist. And uh, he was being interviewed about Ukraine. And he said, I ha and he said, I have to choose my words carefully. And then he said, um, these are not uncivilized refugees from places like Iraq and Afghanistan. These are blonde haired, blue eyed refugees who look just like us. And so as a, a, an Egyptian woman who doesn't have <laughs> blonde hair or blue eyes, I'm wondering who is the us in this equation? And what does that say about who many international news organizations are writing for? And they have um, a Western, their, their audience is a Western audience. And that explains why Ukraine has gotten tremendous amounts of attention even where, uh, and uh, as you say, it is an unquestionable humanitarian crisis. But there are equal levels of suffering, if not more, in many other parts of the world that have never gotten a fraction of the media attention because Ukraine is geopolitically relevant for the West, and that's who these papers are writing for. So what does it mean to be a truly universal news organization that treats everyone suffering equally? That's the model that we're trying to build, and it's, and it's really difficult, right? Because, again, why are these outlets writing for Western audience because those are the monetizable audiences. And so it comes back to the business model, actually. Um, and so for us, this, uh, this agenda to decolonize international journalism is, uh, is challenging norms on a whole number of fronts, um, including uh, this question of, of who are you writing for? And, and to be truly, uh, when, when the Ukraine um, crisis broke out, many Africans were, uh, and I would include myself within them, were you know, uh, almost insulted that, OK, so our suffering doesn't matter to you all. Um, but when the suffering is you know, closer to home, it suddenly, it suddenly breaks through. So there's a, there's a whole 
complexity uh, so, of, uh, of dynamics it, at play here. It's not new either. I mean, because we've saw we've seen that with the Kosovo crisis, for example. At the same time, there was a big Sudanese crisis, and and so by, side by side, when you see those, the the number of hours and intensity of reporting, the number of dollars that go for um, aid programming, etc., is you know massively disproportionate, and so it is. You know, it's not something that's brand new, but it is something that feels like it would, with all of the work you're doing to try to really change this narrative, um, something big like this happens and it can kind of upend the, the progress it feels like sometimes. In a way, it actually helps because it exposes just how yeah, bad the problem is. Fair enough. And there has been since the, the onset of coverage of Ukraine, I think some people pulling back and reflecting on, oh, wow, okay. And, and the racism of the coverage was uh -huh. certainly called out. And so I think it has actually been um, a helpful reminder to people of those inequities and um, in a way helps us make the case. Interesting, great. Um, question, yeah. Where do you go and how difficult is it for you to recruit? <laughs> Where do you go and how difficult is it for you to recruit staff to further the new humanitarian mission? It's a, it's a very organic process of uh, trying to build networks of communities in all the various <laughs> countries in which we work. So we have um, a very small staff, but we work with a network of freelance journalists, and that allows us to be more nimble and agile in our coverage. Uh, it also allows us to tap into the local networks that exist. Um, and so at times we're going to local newsrooms in um, Somalia, for example, has just uh, launched its first female-only uh, led Somali women's media outlet and we worked with them to publish uh, a piece that just came out um, a, a few days ago. Uh, uh, excruciating piece also talks about the, the trade-offs women have to make to help their children in the midst of famine. Um, but that was written by uh, a woman from this um, news outlet called Bilan. So it's, it's trying to uh, build relationships with the local journalism um, worlds in, in various countries and then uh, work with them either, as we were discussing before, um, in partnership or ultimately bring them onto our staff. We have work to do as well um, to diversify and, and better represent the people we serve, but we're, we're making good progress, uh, particularly in working with local journalists. Um, but it's the, the recruitment process, it's, it's um, as I was saying before, it's a very manual, you really have to be intentional and put in the time and effort to, to find these people because um, the the ones that have already risen to the top are well known, but there's a whole cadre of other talented journalists underneath that need to be identified and then nurtured and, and given the opportunities that often they haven't had because they haven't been to Western education or gone to Ivy League schools or all the rest of it. An incredible both opportunity and challenge though is to give voices to, to those local journalists um, because they're gonna be everywhere. And, and so many of them really can't get a voice on the international stage. So being a, amplifying those is actually what, another huge missionary, it feels like. So it's amazing. Um, yeah. Um, go ahead, you go ahead and I'll, uh, I'll repeat it. Okay. So um, thank you very much. Very insightful conversation so far. I'm curious to know um, from your um, experience what you think are some of the opportunities to link in dialogue to action. And when I say action, I mean specifically at higher institutions, uh, especially where funding typically happens or where aid happens and you need some restructuring as we've discussed of the design of aid and journalism for it. So what do you think are some of the opportunities of linking some of the things that we're seeing on, on ground, some of the patterns to actual action? I assume that's gone through with the mic. We'll, we'll just restate too, so thank you. And, and I think the, the, the short question is, um, how do you see some of the work that's being done um, and your vision for either the decolonization efforts or financing efforts or even programmatic efforts really translating to changes in, in action, in humanitarian action, and how can you do something about that? I think we're very lucky as a uh, specialized newsroom to have a very targeted audience that is in a position to act on the information that we provide. And so we've seen in many cases that our journalism has led to donors either starting new aid programs because we've identified an emerging need that hadn't been um, recognized before or uh, actually not even in the policy making space but to citizens launching a new petition to try to fight for refugee rights um, and so uh, across the board 
uh, we see impact in a number of ways. We, we poll our audience and have found that um, a quarter of them use our stories to push for internal policy change or external policy change. Our stories are used to deploy people um, to the field. Uh, they are used to inform financing decisions. So actually we're in a very, as journalists, a very privileged position in, in that regard. One of the things though that I would say as an opportunity is often the discussions can become very polarized, particularly this topic of decolonization. And so one of the things we're trying to do as a kind of neutral um, platform is to bring different voices together and allow them to understand each other's perspectives. And we did this uh, last year. We brought together 50 government and, and foundation policymakers with uh, racial justice activists and local humanitarians who are working um, on the ground in, in different countries and had and facilitated a conversation between them about what does this concept of decolonizing aid mean? What would it look like in practice? What are the barriers? What are the obstacles? And as a result of that, we saw a lot of these um, funding institutions go back and try to look through their own systems and procedures and see how they can adjust things to be able to fund more locally, as one example. So uh, I think um, you know, journalism can have an impact. It sometimes takes years of building a body of work that helps contribute to a certain um, understanding of the way the world is working and, and certain narratives. But sometimes it can also be really direct and um, and one of the ways of doing that, I think, is moving away from the sensational uh, good guy, bad guy um, kind of journalism that you can see often and into a more nuanced conversation, which might not be as sexy and might not go wild on, on social media, but actually opens the door for, for real change because people feel more comfortable talking about the, the challenges in an honest way. Thank you. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the UN is moving. Um, you mentioned that uh, the UN is moving towards, under the leadership of Martin, I can't remember. Griffiths. Name. Griffiths, yes. Um, towards promoting peace building as part, as a, as a link to aid. Um, can you explore that a little bit? What kind of impact do you think that that would have? Because conflict is driving so much of the, uh, the problems that we're facing, and, and yet not enough effort is really being paid to um, reducing conflict. So yeah, I mean the question is again that Martin Griffiths and um, UN um, and UN circles are really advancing the idea of um, um, advancing diplomacy um, in advance and maybe upstream of humanitarian uh, issues. Um, can you comment a little more about that? So it's, it's not only uh, it's a UN-wide priority. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has has said conflict um, prevention is actually one of his, his top priorities and for exactly the reasons you suggest, that it's just not sustainable um, to keep responding to the result of conflict and if we don't stop these conflicts from happening in the first place, we're going to be in a situation that is completely untenable. Um, I think what's new or, or even a bit controversial is for humanitarians to be engaging in that space because humanitarians are meant to be the neutral, impartial actors who don't take a side in the conflict and they're just going in to help the people affected Fire and the firefighters. Mm. And for them to engage in what is a much more political space of what they now call humanitarian diplomacy um, is pushing the limits a little bit of, of humanitarianism. And, and coming back to what I was saying earlier, I think that's where things are headed, right? That and unless if we stick to the really traditional definitions, we're finding ourselves in a very uh, untenable situation. And so uh, what that looks like is, um, you know, they, uh, for example, the UN office that's responsible for humanitarian issues is the one that brokered this deal between Russia and Ukraine to get grain exports, uh, the so-called Black Sea Grain Initiative, um, which is really a, a, an exercise in, in kind of mediation in getting these two sides to agree to a solution that will ultimately have humanitarian benefits, but isn't in itself uh, a humanitarian relief activity. I think we're seeing more and more of that kind of thing. We're also seeing um, an increasing recognition of the links between humanitarian relief and peace, for better or for worse, meaning that at times humanitarian actors can actually have a negative impact on peace because let's say you give aid to one part of a community and not to another and that actually contributes to fueling tensions that can lead to conflict. And so a better understanding that all of this is interlinked, they now call it the triple nexus, the mm -hmm. peace humanitarian development nexus. Um, the UN loves its, its it does indeed. <laughs> terminologies and uh, jargon. 
Um, but I think it's a, it's a positive move, to, move towards recognizing that none of these things exist in silos and that you have to be very conscious of how what you do in a particular space has an impact more broadly. It, I, I wouldn't say it's anywhere near enough at this stage, but it's, it's heading there slowly. Yeah, and I think I'm going to um, wrap us. Uh, I think it's time to wrap us up. And so I, I once again, um, really interesting conversation and really interesting to hear the, your vision and also the sense that you have of the, the impact and the future work of the new humanitarian. Um, so it's been such a, a you know, pleasure to have you here and talk today and take some great questions. Thank you all for your questions. And um, really, once again, thank you for joining us. And, uh, and congratulations on uh, being the recipient of the Weitz Award. And um, um, on behalf of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and Harvard University and the school, uh, we thank you for being here and thank you for uh, this great conversation. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.